Welcome to the Historic Application Security Theater here in downtown Codeville. As a reminder, please silence any devices and top 10 lists. Note that this venue has several exits. In the event of an emergency, just keep shifting left until you reach one. In tonight's performance, the role of Eliza will be played by ChatGPT. The role of Fido2 Key will be played by 20 slides of phishing awareness. The role of XSS will be played by 20 years of mistaking input validation for secure frameworks. For a PDF of tonight's program, please provide your name, title, email address, and purchasing power. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Which means, this week we chat with Sarah Harvey about a conference organizer's perspective on creating killer presentations. In the news segment, Volns versus Secure Design, the domains of aging projects, Miracle Pointer makes use after free less free for attackers, the 90s had AI too, and more. Break a leg and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show to learn the latest tools and techniques to understand DevOps, applications, and the cloud. Your trusted source for the latest AppSec news, it's time for Application Security Weekly. This is episode 271, recorded January 29th, 2024. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Happy Monday. I, I feel like I need to come up with something funny to say after your awesome intro, but I'm unfortunately... Not we can run with Happy Monday. It seems a Happy Monday, and John is smiling. This is good. We also have Akira Brand and some tails in the camera as well. Uh, hello, Akira and Four Legged Fred. Hello. Um, this is Sparkle Goth. He says hi, and uh, I'm Akira, and I also say hi. Hello, Sparkle Goth. We could always use a fourth host. Uh, and of course, hello to you, Akira. We're always hello. looking for great guests for all of our Security Weekly shows. Submit your suggestions by completing the form at securityweekly.com slash guests. Another announcement, don't let third-party risk ruin your Valentine's Day. Join Adrian Sanabria and Bill Brenner for understanding third-party risk by studying third-party breaches. Adrian loves exploring risks through real breaches and incidents. Bill loves thinking about third-party risks, and they both love our partner for this webcast, Process Unity. Visit securityweekly.com slash valentinerisk to register for the webcast. You'll love it. Sarah has been operating in a conference organizer capacity for B-Sides SF since 2018, starting with managing volunteer operations to now program operations. Program operations encompasses everything surrounding the design of the conference program itself, to running the CFP, to facilitating reviews, to schedule design, to presenter logistics, to operations and firefighting during the actual conference event. Hello, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hopefully no uh, firefighting today, but uh, we'll get you some, some uh, maybe exercise some of those muscles as we throw all kinds of weird questions towards you. But many of those weird questions is we wanted to bring you on to talk about your background and your role you know, as a conference organizer on presentations. Because I think organ or conferences especially, they're motivated by having people come with good presentations. But it's hard to figure out from an abstract what's going to be good, what's not good, you know, how people put them together. So rather than me prompt you with something, let's actually start off with your thoughts, which you posted to Mastodon a couple months ago. But um, walk us through maybe a little bit of your, you know, how you approach presentations yourself before we start talking about looking at others. Yeah, so a little bit of background for me. Um, I work, uh, besides doing B-Sides SF, it's obviously not my main job. I do that on a volunteer basis. I do have an actual job. I work in security and privacy, now in management. Um, but I have done a lot of public speaking probably over the past decade or so. Uh, there is, uh, and over that entire time, there's uh, things I've done that have worked well, things that I've done that have not worked well. Uh, generally, my personal approach to a presentation is very much, uh, yes, it has to be informative and it has to teach something new, but how can I make it entertaining? I think uh, we all uh, are aware that uh, sometimes sitting in a lecture hall for a long period of time is a little bit tiring. Uh, we want a little bit of pizzazz. Um, so uh, when I look to put together presentations, I look for, is a topic interesting? Is it going to be intriguing? 
um, is a topic not interesting, in which case I take it as a personal challenge to see how I can make it exciting. And how can I really get the message uh, across through a combination of like interesting perspectives, interesting visuals, interesting like thought provoking questions uh, to get the audience to actually be fully engaged for 30 to 45 minutes. Totally. Interesting is one of our favorite words here on Application Security Weekly, as we, uh, as listeners will know from our last episode. But I want to jump on that aspect, actually, because there are two things you said there. One is maybe the topic is, I'll, I'll use a synonym, you know, or an antonym, boring. How do I make it not boring? Or am I making it interesting because it's topical, but everybody else is? So let's, let's talk about actually the CFPs, for example. Um, You've probably seen a lot of good topics come through, but possibly a lot of repeated topics come through. I'm here. I'm thinking perhaps like ChatGPT, something like that comes out, and probably everyone thinks, "Oh, here's how I can make interesting because we're going to do X with ChatGPT." How do you how do you manage those when they, when they come in through CFPs, and how do you try to how would you recommend people approach something that everybody else is talking about at the same time or trying to? Um. So I will note that for the extremely like popular topics, yes, we get flooded with them. And it's sometimes a challenge, especially if we have a lot of really good speakers and really good uh, submissions. It can be very difficult to try and figure out which ones we're going to include into the program. We obviously cannot make, say, the entire program about security of chat GPT or security of generative AI. So we have to... Uh, balance the program so that it is a well-rounded program for everyone uh, in the audience. Um, in general, um, when looking for something to submit, uh, I would recommend both just talking to your peers and folks in the industry and maybe your coworkers, maybe your friends and family to see, is this becoming enough of a hype topic that maybe I don't need to be the 20th person submitting this? Uh, and alternatively, uh, consider how it might tie into either an unusual topic or field, or uh, it's very clearly a different perspective. Um, there's a bit there I mentioned about talking to your peers, friends, coworkers. Uh, that's one of the ways I uh, discover whether something is going to make a compelling topic uh, to submit for a talk. Because uh, if I have, I find that if I have to explain the same thing about 10 or 20 times and explain my perspective 10 or 20 times, it probably means not many people know about it and it's worth talking about and uh, at a larger scale to a larger audience. And that's a good detail too, that, that aspect of having to explain something. So tell us maybe a bit more when you're, you know, talking to, talking to some peers, getting some feedback, will this good or not? I think if you just approach as the question, is this topic about using chat GPT to write phishing emails without typos in them? Interesting. You know, that's kind of a close-ended question, and maybe that's not the same pitch. Tell us a little bit how you, how would you pitch to us, for example, um, a topic that you might think is, has historically been boring that you that you've got a hook on, or something that you're just kind of teasing out. Um, a lot of it is, I think it starts off by going to people and saying, "How are you thinking about this? How are you thinking about this?" I think as security practitioners, we're going around, we find security problems. There's novel security problems that pop up all the time. Right. And you're wondering, am I going to be the first one inventing the wheel here or am I going to be the 10th or the 100th person inventing the wheel? Um, and it's hard to know until you talk to people. There's some things obviously we can't speak about to people outside the company because of NDAs or what have you. Um, but high level approaches are always totally fine to talk about. And so you can say, oh, how are you thinking about this? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? And uh, what can pop out of that is you either find out that, I mean, usually you walk away saying, okay, this is the solution I'm going to try at home based or in my company based on what, uh, what other people are doing. But you can also use it as, hmm, maybe we're doing something that is different from what other people are doing. Maybe we should talk about it. So like, uh, uh one thing, uh, the talk that is listed, uh, that I shared earlier, um, on talking about privacy programs, privacy is very new. Thinking about privacy regulatory process is very new. It sounds very boring, but it's also very chaotic right now. Um, and the thing that I found myself doing was going to different people and, and saying, like, oh, here's what we're thinking about this. Well, how are you trying on it? Every single person said to me, oh, you're, you're way ahead of the curve here. You should talk about how you and your company decided to come up with these processes uh, because we'd all like to hear it and we like to see how it all fits together, big picture. 
So, you know, coming in and, and asking, you know, what else uh, are people doing? Is what you're doing unique? Is it of interest to people? Do you have specific, I think people are very interested in solutions. Everyone can talk about like, oh, here's my perspective of XYZ, but people are very interested in solutions. And especially besides SF is a very, uh, is a, it builds itself as a very practitioner, security practitioner focused conference. And what you end up seeing in a lot of the talks and we end up curating for is a lot of solutions that people want to hear about from other companies to security problems. I, I like that because solutions also feels like there's something to take away that I don't, yes. I, I don't sit there passively and just be like, okay, that was fun. I heard something that was engaging, but then we'll walk away and do nothing with it. So I'm right. curious too, because one of the traps of solutions can also be, as you were describing, creating a privacy program. I suspect it took more than 30 to 45 minutes to figure out within your org what a privacy program should look like. So how did you choose what to condense? What do you, what do you highlight as like the actionable parts of the solution or the informative parts of the solution for an audience? And, and because you're leaving stuff out, I'm sure. Right. So this, this comes down when, uh, to, you know, when you're putting together an effective CFP, one of the things they're going to ask you is what are your takeaways? And that's, we're not asking that just because we like uh, you writing lots and lots of text for us. Uh, we're asking that because we want to see if you actually understand what you want your audience to walk away with. Um, I think I, generally when we're talking about it, when we're talking about different cool things in security, we are prone to rabbit holing forever and talk about 50 billion stories. And so the takeaways question is to really get you to uh, hone in and focus on your message. And so that same deal with, you know, my talk on privacy programs, I had to sit back and, and sit and think, I have potentially a content for like, you know, a whole track worth of talks. I obviously can't go into extensive detail about everything. What message do I want people to take away? And, and this came back to what are people interested in? They want to see the big picture. So I focused on the big picture. There were a couple of places where I dropped a, a few. Uh, I think uh, one, one peer of mine told me, uh, I dropped enough terms for people to Google uh, as part of the big picture. And so the takeaway was, here's what the big picture looks like. Here's a terminology that is common that you can look up to find more information. Here's a couple of examples of where those details like tie into the big picture. And it's interesting to see very briefly, but for the most part, I am focusing on the big picture. So, and this is the, this, this is your approach. And um, I do encourage everyone to go l watch that YouTube, um, the, the recorded presentation that you have, but you all, and you mentioned that, you know, besides SF is looking for solutions is it's very focused on practitioners. It's also, I think pretty well known, has a very good reputation, well-deserved about being first time presenter friendly and besides SF in particular, I, I think in, in many of them also invest in that. Tell us a little bit about how the organization from the CFP process, as well as to practicing presentations, how's the conference itself, you know, foster that first time presenter skills, techniques, feedback? So one of the things we do for all of these submissions is take a look, we, we evaluate it on two axes. One is, uh, what is the topic uh, broadly? Is this an interesting topic to talk about? Is there uh, some interesting tidbits of information we haven't seen before, or we think it's not just if not, I, I want to be clear, we don't just uh, focus on novelty, but we do want to see, oh, is this an interesting perspective that likely a lot of people haven't uh, seen before. But the other axis we look at is um, uh, organization uh, presentation uh, in the CFP itself, right? Um, and the reason why we split that up is there are going to be situations where the topic is interesting, but the presentation uh, is not quite there yet because the person is a new speaker. Uh, by highlighting that in the review process, we're also uh, effectively telling our reviewers, hey, be careful of any subconscious or unconscious bias you might have for rejecting a, pres a prospective presentation just because it is not organized well, especially if it's from a new speaker. Um, from there, if we see content that looks good and we want to put it into the program, we ask uh, the presenter uh, or the presenter can self-elect, hey, I want to do a dry run or I want to do a couple of practice runs. Um, and we sit down and we uh, review and have them test present to us maybe once or twice, maybe five times until we and, and provide feedback. And then through those iterations, we see, uh, we see maybe 
a kind of really bumpy talk at the start to really nice polished uh, one at the end. And very often the, the presenters walk away very happy having learned through that process and having really understood what their presentation style is uh, in order to provide delivery that both is cohesive uh, and uh, is compelling and not just a laundry list of items. That's really neat just to have that, to provide that feedback and prep from a conference perspective. What's a little bit of, you mentioned like some of them went through maybe three or four, three or four, three to five dry runs, et cetera. What's a little bit of the overhead to expect either on the pre- presenter side, as well as like other conferences wanting to adopt this? You know, what, what should they expect both on timing, uh, you know, slides are, are slides finished the day before or not the day before that type of thing? Yes, uh, I think uh, people forget sometimes, even experienced speakers, including myself, we forget how long it takes to put together a presentation. Um, my general rule is for every, I would say, 30 minutes, I spend uh, 12 hours uh, doing prep. And I want to be clear, the prep isn't just sitting down and, and, you know, writing it, but it's wandering around like in the shower or in the grocery store being like, oh, practicing this delivery, practicing that delivery, is this transition going to go well? And also really looking at making sure my pictures or visuals are very compelling. Um, We also are, I think, as an industry, um, uh, chronic procrastinators. So uh, you (laughs) should... uh, (laughs) <laughs> as a as an organizer, um, I, the thing that I I found most entertaining was uh, at least half the speakers or presenters came to me a uh, day of last year and said, "We're really grateful for like the half a dozen emails you sent to us uh, over the like two months before the conference. We're really sorry we missed all of your deadlines, uh, but we're really glad that everything came together at the last minute." Um, but you, you really have to, especially for the new presenters, really stress, like, you have to start early and start iterating early because that is the only way we have time to uh, really improve it and really make adjustments in a way that you're happy with at the at the very end. And then you feel solid and prepared and not rushed on stage and uh, uncomfortable and feeling like you're stumbling over anything. So the, the time and the that timing is really important. Um, for each of us on the... Uh, who do the actual reviews of the dry runs, I would say, like, say a talk is 30 minutes, that's, you know, 45 minute, like, booked sessions of, okay, 30 minute actual running through and 15 minute feedback. Sometimes it goes over for a whole hour, just giving the feedback. And so, okay, you have five of these, right? Uh, that's, you know, anywhere from three to five hours of reviewing uh, with the presenter for one presentation. Uh, not counting you looking at the slides beforehand, not counting the presenter having to put together the slides and making uh, changes. So it's a lot of work. Many, many, as I said, for me personally, just putting a talk together takes 12 hours. Mm-hmm. And you can see how the time like wraps up if uh, you're really trying to, if, if you're really wanting to hone in on that focus of having a good, engaging, quality talk. Now, there's an aspect there that you mentioned. That I also wanted that, that was that we haven't actually talked about with with others when we've talked about giving presentations earlier. You talked about you know just kind of pitching in an idea to to peers. Is this interesting? Is there something new? How would you approach this? But here you're talking about, especially with new presenters, providing feedback. And there is actually a skill to providing constructive feedback, helpful feedback. How do you approach that? And how do you distinguish between? poor feedback that's, you know, unhelpful versus good feedback that can be guidance and that can be actionable for, for that new presenter? What, what, what do those two uh, dimensions look like? Uh, I would say at a high level, or if I were to do a TLDR on the difference between bad feedback and good feedback, is bad feedback just points out the problem and good feedback actually provides the solution. So when you're looking to provide feedback to presenters or actually really in any situation, even to written one, you can't just go and say, oh, uh, this paragraph sucks or, oh, this paragraph doesn't like, uh, doesn't really convey very much. That's very vague. All it says is there's a problem here, but doesn't actually provide any constructive solutions and constructive su- suggestions, um, especially for new speakers, for example. They're obviously not going to know how to fix things. So you have to go and provide explicit solutions on how to actually fix things. Uh, And so better feedback would be, oh, uh, these points on a slide, uh, it looks like you are uh, um, 
introducing various sections of your presentation. Um, well, as you go through the different sections, the transitions are very abrupt. Let's make sure we uh, wrap up after each section and remind the audience about your three sections. And then that way, uh, the flow is much smoother, right? And so that, that is much clearer as to how, what direction we want to try and take the, the presentation. Um, I always tell the, the presenters as I'm reviewing these, it's like, you're welcome to disregard my suggestion. Like, this is, you know, this is me, like, looking at it. This is obviously coming with my opinion and perspective. If for some reason it is very conducive to your style, then you don't have to listen to it. Uh, other examples of feedback I have are, uh, you can say that, well, the text is hard to read, but that doesn't actually mean anything. So I make jokes like, is this slide written for ants? Because sometimes the text is absolutely minuscule and you cannot see it, <laughs> oh, yeah. right? Or uh, your titles, uh, your section headers are jumping around all over the place because, you know, as you're making a bunch of different edits, like it's uh, uh, things move and adjust over time. And if you flip through the slides really fast, you see like the headers like jumping up and down and like the 5% of the audience, which includes me, unfortunately, will notice that on every single slide and not pay attention to the rest of the presentation. <sighs> Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you um, and that is uh, sometimes what really makes an awesome conference presentation is the accessibility component so for example like this text is too hard to read maybe it's like the the f uh, color of the font and the color of the background is like too close so someone that may have some trouble with seeing couldn't actually see the font or maybe the person is not talking in a way that is loud enough for someone who may be hard of hearing, or maybe there can be extra like things that someone can add to a presentation to make it more accessible. Like who knows, maybe even subtitles or something like that. In your experience, what would be like a baseline of accessibility that you wish you saw in every single conference presentation out there? Um, the tip I always, so it's interesting you talk about access, accessibility here, here. So I have actually pretty bad vision. Um, I, I appear as if I can see, but I have like really thick glasses. And so, um, visual things really pop out at me much more than to other people. And so I hone in on them and I use that also as a way to make things, uh, more accessible. Um, I also tell presenters, remember, like you're giving a presentation, I think there's some stat that like humans take 90% of their information through their eyeballs. So like, if that's like where 90% of your information is coming from, you really better get it right. And then this ties into the accessibility of like, make sure you're having a presentation that is actually accessible visually for those who can see, um, uh, to, to make sure that like, it's, it actually like hits home. Um, but more specifically, the advice I give is be very mindful of the formatting, the text formatting you use, and the layouts on your slides. Because I think we just assume, we, we often assume it's an afterthought, but uh, it can both be very, a very useful tool and also something to easily ignore. So things like fonts don't match, or some text is really skinny and hard to read, or some text is too bold and is overpowering the slide, right? Or giant walls of text that you know, are really condensed and hard to see. Uh, even, you know, uh, even looking at code on the screen, right, that can be very overwhelming and can actually detract from the actual presentation. Um, you can maybe paint it as an access accessibility issue, but generally speaking, it's like, well, if you've put a lot of interesting things on the slide, everyone's going to focus on the slides and they're not going to actually focus on what you're actually saying. So, Focus, like thinking about the text formatting and the layout on your slides uh, and being thoughtful about it is going to automatically fix like at least 50 to 70% of the accessibility issues on your slides. And then everything else is like minor tweaks here and there. That's, what, there's an aspect of that. I wonder if you mentioned that you take, you know, 10 to 12 hours for every 30 minutes of slide prep. That That's, that's yours rubric. Um, I'm sure people have different ratios of that number, but what does it feel like to be done with that prep? Both on the sense of either the slide content, like you're describing, fonts look good, fonts are consistent, as well as the spoken part. You, you know, just so others, others can feel like, well, I spent 10, 12 hours, I'm done. Um, versus, oh, I 
have this feeling or I see this aspect and that's another way I know I'm done or I know I'm ready? Um, there's a thing that a uh, lab I was part of uh, used to do, which was um, they would have these challenges to try and give presentations where every single slide was just the picture. And the thing, the, re- the, the problem with doing that for some people is that there's no text and you cannot remember what it is you're supposed to say about that slide without any speaker notes. So my general, like, my think I'm done with this presentation is if there were no speaker notes and I were to just go on stage and blindly present, could I do, like, it, it won't be perfect. 100 percent because different people and especially me i do actually rely on speaker notes a lot um it won't be perfect but if you can get it like 70 percent like correct to what you were going to originally present without speaker notes um and without too much text on slides um especially on the full picture slides um then you're probably in a good spot then that's probably when you are done um, for what it's worth, I never feel like I'm fully done with slides. Uh, and even after giving the presentation, I'm like, oh, okay, I have found like 10 other things I should have fixed than I ran into as I was uh, giving the actual presentation, uh, which is fine. You can give the same talk at a couple of places and you iterate it and tighten it up each time, depending on what the venue is. Yeah, practice is great. And I know a lot of conferences, they do provide the, the capacity for audience feedback, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, rate, it, rate this on a score from one to five. So there is that, that postmortem, if you will, just that, that gets into a thumbs up or, or, or a number. How, especially for first time presenters, that can feel discouraging if it's negative feedback, if it's not great feedback. Um, what are some ways that you would help them, you know, still push forward, carry on, not be discouraged about a particular fumble? Because I think you you alluded to, perhaps you've made a mistake or two in the past. I know I have for sure. I've, I've given some mm-hmm. presentations that are ooh, snoozers. Um, the, well, always have a group of friends who are always going to tell you good job, no matter how much <laughs> you screwed up the presentation. That always helps. Uh, if you do not have such friends, I recommend finding them. Uh, they are. This is the one case where it's like, oh, my yes people uh, are here to tell me that I'm still cool and I'm still okay and my <laughs> reputation it hasn't helps. fallen into the toilet <laughs> just because of one terrible presentation. Um, but, uh, you know, taking that time to just think and reflect and, and making sure that, I don't know, get, getting uh, yourself on top of all of the emotions from that. Is is probably valuable, um, and then you know use that for you. Well, at least stick with you the next time you write a presentation. It's like, oh man, last mm-hmm. time I tried uh, presenting it in this way with this joke, and ooh, that did not land well. I'm not going to do that again. Uh, and you can like tweak it and adjust it uh, and get better next time. Um, for what it's worth, uh, a lot of people also the, a lot. There's a lot more people who are going to be naysayers than positive sayers. People who are uh, happy with your presentation like they may never actually tell you that they're happy with it or they find it cool and you only find it uh, about it much uh, uh, much later um but the people who are are naysayers out especially if they really don't like the presentation they'll be the first to say there's only like maybe two or three of them so uh, be aware that there's that like imbalance too of the explicit feedback you get and remember that there's probably a lot more people who like it than than didn't like it um, the other thing you can do is years later, you can compare your old presentations to your new presentations. You're like, wow, those old ones really sucked. And then you look at the new ones and you're like, oh, I'm amazing now. Uh, and that's yeah, always a good yeah, feeling. That's a great point. Seeing that, yeah, that, that is seeing a great that, point. Like, mm-hmm. past thing. And so uh, along that same vein, I wanted just to squeeze this in here too. The, um, you know, the CFP for B-Sides SF has passed, but um, mm-hmm. there are many other B-Sides and other conferences coming along. And of course, uh, there will be a B-Sides SF next year. So that CFP, how do you convince people, especially those new, those, those first timers, new presenters to get over a fear, a reticence of like, oh, I've, you know, I've submitted to, I've been rejected a couple of times. I'm always going to be rejected. How, how do you? How would you help people get over being scared about submitting to a to a CFP? Uh, two things. Uh, don't make the decision to reject yourself. Let us make that 
decision for you. Uh, because <laughs> if uh, you're making that decision for yourself, then obviously we're never going to see your CFP. So it, even if you're not sure it's good, submit something. Uh, and then, you know, if we are able to get our ducks in a row, we can provide feedback if you ask uh, if something uh, got rejected. Um, the second thing is um, I, I'm making this assumption people in the audience have friends. Uh, you know, talk to your friends, have them review. Uh, talk to maybe mentors you have. Talk to people who are your coworkers who are uh, more experienced in the field who are public speakers. Um, many of them tend to be on program committees. Many of them tend to be uh, uh, asked to do keynotes and have been through this process over and over again. They can provide that early feedback to you before you actually go and submit it. And in that way, like, and a lot of these people, you know, spoiler, we're, those of us who are public speakers, who are frequent public speakers, we're not going to be public speakers forever. It, it's tiring. We move on. Right? We want to see the, the newer generations come in and give uh, give talks. And anytime we see someone who's like, oh, I'm thinking about submitting, but I'm not sure. I've been rejected before. But we're very excited to help you because that means we don't have to talk. We've got someone else to, to give the talk. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot more support out there, I think, than people realize. Uh, and it can be very hard for to, to feel like you're able to ask your help, uh, ask for help. But the only way we learn is by failing a bunch of times. And people love helping other people, uh, especially as they, even if they fail a bunch of times, because people are very invested to see other people succeed. So um, stick with it. Find buddies, find help. They will push you to submit. And then, uh, uh, then you'll find yourself in the situation where you're like, oh, I'll submit this thing. It's kind of hokey and terrible. And then you're, and then it gets accepted and you're like, ah, oh, I got to go and write a presentation. Now. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Yes. So, Sarah, I'm curious how, um, I'm sort of thinking about that and like, you know, first timers and it, it's my preferred way of doing this is like, if I've got a new talk or something, I'll try to do it at a smaller audience before I go and do it like on a keynote or something. Do you see people coming into B sides, or at least the, the talks that you guys accept? Do you have a sense of how many there are first timers, or have they at least practiced a little bit before, or any sort of breakdown around that? We definitely see at B sides uh, two sets of things. Uh, anyone who is, especially SF Bay local, this is their first like bigger talk venue that isn't uh, an actual meetup, because some of the meetups are maybe a couple hun hundred at most, and we're about two thousand people. Um, so we're kind of that testing ground of like, if they pass and get through B-sides, then uh, B-sides SF especially, then it, um, because we're larger, they, they feel more motivated to submit to even some of the larger ones. Like I've seen some of the talks presented at B-sides SF eventually appear at Black Hat or eventually appear at DEF CON. Um, so we're definitely a bit of those, those testing grounds um, that you're graduating from meetup talk to mid-level kind of, fun practitioner talk uh, venue to very important uh, talk venue. Um, so yes, going to some of the smaller meetups and trying it out is, is ideal as well. Um, trying it out with it internally within the company is ideal. There's often a lot of tech companies that have um, internal venues for giving presentations and you can try it out there and get that practice more directly before you go to some of the, the larger, larger things. But oftentimes people, what I see like, Getting back to Mike's original question of like, how do you convince people after they've been rejected a bunch of times to submit? That's a different problem from getting them to like submit to begin with, because at that point it's like, they want, you know, they want to give talks, right? They're just don't feel that they're ready for that main stage anymore. So my answer there is more, okay. Like, yes, the main stage is scary, right? It takes time to get, yourself into a position where you are accepted by the main stage, but there is a lot more support around you to get you to that main stage than you think, right? We're not this super exclusive club where only people who are really cool and know each other uh, very well get accepted. Like we do actually want fresh blood coming in to give talks on these stages over time. So what is, um, we've been talking about B-Size FF, SF a little bit peripherally, Give us a little bit of a pitch. What, what are some highlights that people can expect? And uh, for those that you want to, you know, get, get people to attend as well, to be in, in the audience for that. 
So, um, B size SF is interesting because you know there's a lot of conferences that, uh, or actually, I think most people, a lot of people, when they think about going to conferences, are like I'm going to sit in the track and see a bunch of talks. And yes, we have that, but we also have a large like collaborative space as well. Um, and the thing that we, one of the the missions or intents for the conference is we want to get people to talk to each other. We want people to talk about what's going on in security, what's going on in privacy. Um, we want that intermingling and cross pollination of ideas, right? Uh, and so, any way we in which we can encourage that, we're going to do it. So, some examples of that is we have a notion of villages where we have different. Uh, it's very similar. If you've been to DEF CON and you've seen villages at DEF CON, exactly same concept, right? Uh, but much smaller scale, right? Different little groups uh, with different areas that have various activities slash uh, learn about different things on that small sc- uh, village scale. Um, we uh, There's a thing that I'm introducing this year, which is birds of a feather, which is some more unstructured uh, facilitated discussions on security and privacy topics, uh, broadly speaking. So instead of having coming in and being like, okay, it's just the presenter telling you their opinion and you go home and internalize that message or don't, right? Uh, we instead have sessions where there's gonna be a facilitator um, uh, encouraging groups of people to discuss on a topic and do share back. And it's very unstructured, no need to have formal slides, or you can have formal slides, it's up to you. Um, we've on and off had lightning talks, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, it depends on the year. Um, and then uh, I think it's just really the the accessibility of the, the cost of the conference or one of the cheaper conferences, despite having a lot of content. Uh, and we really encourage the the like talking to each other uh, as much as possible. Um, I think is probably one of the biggest draws for the con- this conference of brothers. Um, our lobby is much smaller, so our lobby con therefore is is very close knit. And I'm sure to help keep those uh, those costs down so it's accessible for um, attendees is through sponsors. So I'm sure that you'll, the CFP might be closed, but I'm sure you're still looking yes. for, for additional sponsors Absolutely. as always. So yes, if you're out there, have some sponsor money, go send it to uh, Sarah and B-Size F- SF way. So one final thing that we're doing this year is we're, we're putting together a yearbook. And in those yearbooks, there are superlatives. And one of them is AppSec is most likely to what? But help us fill in the blank here. Think uh, for twenty twenty four really surprise us. I think there's a it's been a lot of changes going on in security recently, and I think uh, twenty twenty four might, especially with a lot of new technologies, twenty twenty four I think is going to be a year of surprises for AppSec. Ooh, I'm looking forward to being surprised. That will be very nice after 20 years of cross-site scripting. But uh, that's just a little bit of editorialization. I do want to say thank you uh, genuinely as friends and peers, Sarah. This was a good conversation. So uh, no, no irony there. We, we enjoyed it. We appreciate it, especially from the perspective of the, the conference organizer. So thanks for, for bringing in that angle to us and, and talking about presentations. No problem. Thank you for having me. I'd like to thank Sarah once again, thank John and Akira, and thank everyone else. We're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. <laughs> 